These are the African-American faces of Georgia's jazz age. Their lives were as complex, dynamic, and fast-paced as the decade they lived in. The 1920s really represents a kind of culmination, if you will, of many things that have been a long time in coming. This is a time period where you start having more um, activism, right, at home. So Marcus Garvey, who was the Jamaican-born activist who was really an advocate for African Americans to, to migrate back to Africa to establish a, a community there that allowed for them to be free. And these different Garveyites were throughout the South. They weren't just in the North, they weren't just in New York. In this time period, there is a resurgence of the Klan. And then you have this moment where there is a, a cultural phenomenon. The new mores, uh, the new music, the new technical capabilities, radio, recordings, all of that changes the landscape of how we not only uh, exchange culture, but how we receive it. We now have the time, we have space to develop the new Negro. So the 1920s really represents this time where the new Negro is exploring every kind of, every kind of new creative way of expressing themselves. We have a number of artists, especially when you move from the 20s into the 30s with Hell Woodruff coming from New York to Atlanta, establishing an art program at the Atlanta University Center. So Atlanta was the place of, as Booker T called it, Negro progress, because we had a kind of new generation of Negroes right here in the South. You didn't have to leave the South to be in a educated environment. So Auburn Avenue becomes this hub of black businessmen who not only are well trained, but under segregation, they had to do their business on Auburn Avenue because they couldn't do it other places. Auburn Avenue, which used to be a dusty road, became the richest Negro street in America. Ex-slaves who once knew the sting of the whip walked with pride as they patronized the 72 black-owned stores on Auburn Avenue or worshiped at the historic churches. Ex-soldiers from the First World War boldly wore their uniforms as they shopped for hats and cufflinks at Jordan's department store. So the First World War, um, I think people really underestimate its impact on African American history. And of course, African Americans serving in Europe uh, got a chance to see another part of the world that they had never seen before or even imagined. 1919, Soldiers Return Home. One of the things that was published, I think it was in The, the Workman, was that you may have changed, but we haven't. Traditions will remain the same. So when these soldiers are returning to their southern homes, they were stripped of their uniforms. If they didn't take their uniforms off, some were killed, if not beaten extremely badly. This is going to be the opportunity for these men to assert their sense of freedom, their sense of justice, and claim their citizenship and manhood. The powerful aspect about jazz is that it does reflect, I think, an essential aspect of African-American life and expression. That is the whole notion of a music that is freely improvised, uh, that you make the music whenever and wherever you want to make it. And it's because many people, regardless of race or ethnicity, have been drawn to the sound. James Reese Europe was responsible for the regimental band that toured Europe. And so James Reese Europe and this regimental band introduced jazz to Europe. At one point, uh, I think it was a French soldier who went to one of the trumpet players and looked at his horn to see what was unique about it because there's no way a horn can make those sounds because it was so arresting to them. Retrospectively, we look at the jazz age because F. Scott Fitzgerald and the writers, they talked about the 1920s. It was what jazz represented a rejection of the Victorian kind of mores of the 19th century, uh, women and short haircuts and smoking cigarettes. Jazz was the music that seemed to associate, that was the soundtrack for that kind of opening up of American life and culture. Women had already started bobbing their hair, but listening to jazz made them want to cut it even shorter. Jazz made everyone want to dance the Charleston and the Black Bottom harder and longer. Ma Rainey, a native of Columbus, Georgia, and her Georgia jazz band performed at the 81 Theater. But 
not everyone was amused. So the church is really one of those uh, important and complicated institutions that in its interest of becoming fully American, it embraced many of the racist and, and ideas about what it meant to be black. To be black was to be immoral. Uh, to play jazz was to be black and to be immoral. Many of the early jazz musicians rejected uh, the term jazz. They had preferred ragtime band or ragtime orchestra uh, because of all of the connotations of jazz as being kind of immoral and this and that and the other. That's why we do jazz at our church every third Sunday on purpose because it's important to reclaim this creative heritage called jazz. I would separate the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, from kind of the, the religious antagonisms toward jazz because they, I think they come from separate places. We had a movie called Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. The film, it really, I think, inspired people to, to start bringing the Klan together again as a way to protect their interests. It wasn't just protecting white women, it was seeing that black progress was going to undermine any kind of white success, but also destabilize what was already established. It was a complete lie, and that complete lie was spread through the movies, and people said, you know, at last, somebody's telling the truth that all of our problems and the loss of our Southern way of life was because of slaves. <laughs> Although no civil rights bill passed in Georgia in the 20s, that didn't stop the NAACP from organizing Atlanta's black population to vote on a bond referendum that made the city build Washington High School. So the irony of segregation in the South is that it created a kind of very dense environment so that you had the educated and the uneducated all living in each other's midst. And so that made for poor and un uneducated people, it gave them an opportunity to see the possibilities of becoming a pharmacist or a doctor or a dentist. And so all of these things, I think, contributed to making Atlanta a pretty special place in the South. Your ancestors were not just slaves. That was a condition. But your roots go back to Africa. If you draw from that and you'll make meaning from that through your music, through your poetry, through your writing. So I think we're seeing that across the South into the North, but I think it's expressed more freely in places like New York and Chicago. But it's here too. In our collections, you know, 300 plus collections, we have a number that reach back to the 1920s. These are traces of the lives of African Americans in a time period in American history where this idea of freedom was being realized in not so definite ways like you would have like the Harlem Renaissance, but in these subtle ways through education, through um, acquisitions of material things that really kind of, um, you were able to then kind of claim your, your, your space in society or at least represent the progress being made. The foundation that was being built would eventually lead to the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. And in 1929, at 501 Auburn Avenue, the powerful leader of this great movement was born. The Roaring Twenties have long since passed away, but the streets and the places that define the Twenties are still there. And if you listen closely, you can still hear the music and the voices that made the decade fabulous. 